start proceedings, I uh, it's again a great pleasure to welcome uh, Sergey. We are really privileged to have him uh, as our speaker uh, for the materials uh, seminar series. Uh, just for um, everyone, this is a joint uh, MSc seminar series co-organized by Arizona State University and University of Arizona. And uh, this runs, this is the inaugural event. So it run and, but we have seminar speakers all the way through to spring uh, 2021, end of spring 2021. And uh, it's a very, really diverse set of speakers um, and uh, ranging from, you know, very applied aspects of materials engineering to fundamental aspects of material science. And in this sense, I think Sergey brings a lot of uh, insight and uh, expertise and experience in, in uh, theoretical material science and developing modeling for materials. Uh, anyway, I keep referring to him as Sergey, but Dr. Sergey Tretiak is a deputy group leader in the theoretical division at Los Alamos. Uh, importantly, he's a Los Alamos fellow too. And uh, I'm sure you guys went through his bio, his research interests, I mean, go across the scale. Uh, structure properties of molecules and materials, but more importantly, um, you know, he's going to provide lots of insight on how we can leverage the latest data science tools, the latest machine learning tools for pushing the frontiers of material science. So with that, uh, Sergey, the, the floor is yours. Uh, Krishna, uh, thank you so much. I'm really privileged to participate in this seminar series. And I see that this seminar series became a major mode for interaction, for collaboration across the broad scientific communities across the world. And growth of those seminar series shows me that it's there to stay even after COVID time. So uh, in my talk, I'll be talking about some uh, cross link between uh, data science, artificial intelligence, and modeling of chemical chemistry and materials. Um, because I understand that the audience is very broad, I will keep uh, all the discussion to a generic level. And I would like this lecture to be a discussion. And if you have um, any questions, or if you don't understand some stuff, uh, feel, feel free to interrupt me and to ask questions. So essentially, when we are trying to model uh, some properties in chemistry and materials, then the conventional quantum chemistry um, come to the ceiling because all the algorithms have been optimized and parallelized on the existing computer, uh, computers. And the next question is, how can we cut the corners? And we believe that artificial intelligence and materials uh, and uh, machine learning can be the answer to those fundamental questions. So with the help of those new data science algorithms, we can model observables, energies, uh, make light scale molecular dynamics, get the materials parameters, eff effective Hamiltonians and so forth. So uh, this is a plan for today. So first I will introduce the basic ingredients of machine learning for description of the materials. So don't expect some breakthroughs for uh, data science. We are just borrowing what is, uh, have been standardly developed for say image recognition and so forth software. We are just adapting it um, to the problem at hand by trying to um, sort of like uh, imprint the physical insight, imprint the physical models. So then uh, we'll be talking about uh, molecular dynamics. How can we learn interatomic potentials for both molecules and metals? And then I will uh, show you something else. How can we learn the reduced Hamiltonians? So let's, uh, let me give you upfront what we are doing. So on this axis, you have a numerical cost of the conventional methods. On this end, you'll have uh, purely quantum mechanics. And as you know, that the quantum mechanical solution of the Schoenger equations scales exponentially with the number of particles. And then uh, DFT is so popular because it cuts the scaling anywhere to linear to the cubic scaling. And this is where the realistic materials lies. And there are some family of quantum mechanical uh, effective models. And finally, you have the classical models like molecular dynamics potentials where the cost is linear with the system size. It's uh, essentially uh, makes the classical modeling of the system like uh, uh, beads and springs. 
And once you go from this end to this one, the error in your simulations frequently increases and getting to be uncontrollable. So what we would like to accomplish, we would like to use machine learning to stay on the accuracy of the quantum mechanical models, but cut the numerical expense to the classical model. So in fact, we are learning physical model, uh, models and we are breaking the scaling barriers. You see, this is a scaling barrier and we are enable the simulations that have been pre uh, previously impossible. So let me give you a simple uh, example of molecular dynamics. Let's say you have a large protein or the solid state and we are all loving those movies when the atoms are moving and jiggling around. What do you need to do to do those simulations? You need to calculate the energy as a function of all the coordinates of the nuclei. Then you calculate the forces and conduct the dynamical simulations. So knowing energies and forces would be essential for predicting a number of materials properties. So in principle, one can use beads and spring models, but a better model would be to use quantum mechanical simulation to calculate those quantities. And how can we do that? So uh, we can bypass most of those uh, uh, quantum simulations by using the machine learning and by applying the deep learning via convolutional neural networks. So this is a standard picture when you have the input and here my input would be millions of the molecular structures on which I will be training the neural nets. And of course the training involves the assignment of weights, um, et cetera. And we have the cost function and during the training, we are optimizing the cost function using the back propagation. And I guess it's no news for data science people how the whole loop is working. So, but to do so, to, do, uh, to accomplish this loop, we need to understand what would be an input. So for example, the conventional input would be the image, the spectrum or something else. And here, how can we represent the input? what would be our molecule for the neural net? So we represent the molecule as um, by utilizing the concept of effective atoms, the effective atoms in a specific environment. So those effective atoms are assigned some energies so that we could calculate the energy of the entire system by summating over the energies of the effective atoms. And this uh, fundamental concept was um, put together in the uh, seminal paper of Baylor and Parinella, PRL that goes back to the 2007. So now what is this effective atom and what is the atomic environment? For example, you have water. How can we represent the chemical environment of this oxygen? Of course, the chemical environment into, involves two hydrogens, but also there are other waters. And at some point we need to cut off so that there would be too much information uh, that is derived for this oxygen. And also the energy must be invariant with respect to some symmetry operations such as translation, rotation, and permutation. And that could, should be hardwired into the neural nets. And another one sort of like we could represent this effective environment, what surrounds the effective atoms using so-called uh, symmetry functions. So the symmetry function can include the radial function. So the farther you are from a given atoms, the less impact of the environment is. And also it has the angular functions. The angular function means, so what would be a geometry of all those connections or all of those chemical bonds that a given atom is seen around yourself. So that at the end of the day, we have a training set of millions of molecules and every molecule is bent into the atomic types. The atomic types such as hydrogen, oxygen, carbon and so forth. And each atomic types for each atom is represented by an array of about 300 numbers. And these 300 numbers reflect what is around in terms of this radial and angular distribution functions. 
And then there is a neural net. And at the end of those neural nets, there is an energy of this atom. And finally, when we summate over all those energies, we'll have the energy of the entire molecule and then the energy of the entire training set. And then we could just go across this loop and train the neural nets so that these neural nets would represent as the reference energies which are derived from the quantum mechanical simulations. And this is the structure of any one neural net that has been developed uh, in the group of our collaborator and friend, Adrian Reutberg. And this is not the only type of the neural nets. One could borrow uh, another idea from the many body physics. When we are training the neural nets, again, for the individual atoms in the molecule. However, we input the interaction between those atoms as those green bars, we call it interaction layer, so that you have something like a many body expansion in energies. And this would be a structure of hip and N neural networks. And this uh, neural networks has been developed in Los Alamos, our collaborators, uh, Nick Labers and Kipton Barras. And finally, um, you could go further and uh, like all SSI, this is our, another collaborator, has been developing the so-called AIMnet. And here it's like an expanded version of any system where you could learn several things like energies, charges, and spins. And moreover, we include the self-consistent field updates for this atomic environment vector. So again, so I will not go into all of those details, but I should just mention that one could pick the neural nets of your own preference. And all those uh, systems have been released for a general public. So you could just go and download the software. And the evolution has been from Tayana to the TensorFlow to uh, PyTorch, so that the, it trickled down to the modern software packages. But another uh, important question would be how to make the training set. And this was our first exercise back like four years ago when we took the small molecules, which consist of uh, simple atoms such as carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogens, and built all possible combination of small molecules. So then to sample the chemical space, you see the total number of molecules goes up very fast once you go in size. So for eight non-hydrogen atoms, you already have about 50K of molecules and the entire data sets would be 58K of molecules. So here, this is called chemical space of molecules. But also if you would like to do the molecular dynamics, we also need to have a conformational sampling or in other words, how the energy of the molecule depends on its geometry. So we need to stretch all those molecules along all the coordinates. And once you stretch, the number of configuration goes up very quickly. So across, we have about 22 millions of the data points for those molecules. And we use then DFT and calculated, tabulated all kinds of properties, such as energies, molecular orbitals, densities, etc. And then at the end of the day, if you wish, this is a data set that is again has been released for public. I can send the whole data sets in the form of the hard drive because it's the fastest way of transferring the data sets between uh, over the distance, if you wish. Sergey, this is Oliver. Can I just briefly ask, in yes. this training set, so when you make all combinations, do you include open shell uh, configurations as well? Or this is all closed shell? Excellent, excellent question. For, for this topic, everything includes just closed shell. There is a paper that currently is under review in NatureCom where we extended this thing to the radicals and open shell systems. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you upfront that uh, compared with the open shell system where you have the unbalanced charge, or if you wish the excited states, and if you wish the uh, wave function that is localized on the part of the molecule, then it's uh, much harder to train. But 
hopefully we are overcoming this barrier and can uh, well describe uh, the open shell systems and to do this conceptual DFT and um, do something like Fukui functions and see what would be the uh, things, such things like uh, ionization potentials, uh, electron affinity, all those kind of things. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's well, uh, in the more details, but it goes beyond uh, today's talk and I can talk to you privately about this one later. Okay, uh, just one question. One yeah. question, if I may. Ludwig Adamowicz from Chemistry. I would like to know how you can make a closed system out of uh, um, carbon uh, and nitrogen. You have an even number of electrons, so it's going to be a by itself an open shell system. There's no, no way. No. So yeah, are absolutely. You so, are I mean, you eliminating the the, the systems with uh, odd number of electrons? Yes. So all so those molecules are viable, yeah, a viable, chemically viable closed shell species. Okay, now, uh, if you have closed shell system, well, how do you define a closed shell system? The closed shell system where you have, we have uh, paired electrons. Okay, now, pairing of electrons is, uh, is a, is a complicated matter because you can have uh, an even number of electrons but those uh, the uh, two electrons a pair of two electrons can be separated in space and you can have a double radical I, uh, at some point absolutely i know I, but it's important matter because uh double r a radical is going to be very reactive but at some point the two electrons combine and form a closer systems uh, system and there is not a clear uh, divide, dividing line between when uh, the double radical stops being double radical and when it becomes a closer system. This is absolutely vi uh, viable question. So, and we met this exactly the same uh, setup when we looked at the machine learning of the bond orders in a larger systems, which contains not the eight non-hydrogen atoms, but we went up to 30 non-hydrogen atoms. And there, the question of the double radicals and unstable chemical species was very important. So then you ask the question, should I train on those double radicals or should I exclude those unstable chemical species away from the data set? Um, okay, so, so in other here, words- Ludwig, Sergey, can we uh, push the discussion to okay, after the okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, so Sorry, what, what I'm trying to say to my friends, chemists, is that so far we are operating in a good chemical space. Okay. okay. That's all. Thank you very much. Sorry, yeah, so Ludwig. Yeah. We need to start somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. So now let's push it forward. We have the data sets and we have the neural nets. So now, uh, again, this would be a trivial for the data science people. But for us, it's very important to evaluate the uncertainty. And uh, evaluation of the uncertainty is achieved by so-called active learning. The active learning, in fact, is an approach how to generate data on the fly in the regions of the uncertainty. And we can identify those regions without comparing to the reference data. How can we do that? Again, for it's, it's a trivial for the data science people and the simplest method would be to do the ensemble disagreement. So the ensemble disagreement means if you are training not one, but several neural nets, okay? So it's like a voting for somebody. And if all the votes coincide, then you're making the right choice. And most likely in this region of the phase space, you have the adequate training. But if those training neural nets are vastly different, then most likely that you have inadequate representation and you need more to add to this uh, region more species. So this is not the only one how to evaluate the uncertainty, but it was the foundation for our active learning so, and augmentation, automatic augmentation of the data sets. So just imagine that on one hand, you have the cluster that is running quantum chemistry. On the other hand, you have 
machine learning neural nets training. And machine learning asks, please run me another thousand of molecules. And you supply this another thousand of molecules. Then please run me this thousand of molecules. And then the loop goes on and on and on. And without human intervention, you will see in a moment what it means. So, but at the end, this loop allowed us to, re to achieve the same quality training, but by reducing the data sets from 22 millions to only 5 millions. And this is getting critical, this reduction of the data sets and intelligent navigation, once you would like to go to much more accurate quantum mechanical methods. So this one is an example of uh, data fusion where you would like to take the reference data and to train your neural nets on the density functional theory. However, you would like to expand it to a more accurate couple cluster theory, which is a more accurate quantum mechanical method. Okay, here in the DFT, you are able to get away and train using 5 million data points. However, for the couple cluster, due to enhanced numerical expense, I'm able to do only half million of points. So that what we did, we train our neural nets on this data sets of DFT. Then we fix our, some of the parameters out of the 300,000 parameters. Uh, we fix most of them and retrain only 60,000 uh, uh, of parameters, which are in the middle. And there are some uh, hand waving explanation why we did that. And at the end, we have improved neural nets, which should work at the higher than DFT accuracy. Let's see if this is the case. So again, we have this uh, active learning loop uh, and accomplish it for both sides. So number one, you could see that compared to the atomization energy, the couple cluster give much better answers compared to the DFT atomization energy. But where really the improved quantum mechanical accuracy shines is where we have the chemical reactions. So this is a hydrocarbon isomerization benchmark. And one could compare density functional theory answer, machine learned uh, uh, density functional theory answer versus couple cluster answer and machine learned couple cluster. Okay, so you could see that the neural net uh, are looking and walking like couple cluster. So in fact, we are able to improve using the transfer learning we are able to improve our answer. Again, we can go to the different chemical reaction sets. Uh, if you are modeling, for example, molecular dynamics and soft materials, then the torsions is critical. And by using the uh, machine learned uh, data sets, one can blow away all the density functional theory results and be on the par with uh, a more accurate quantum chemistry. And I just remind you that this method is about 10 in the power of seven, 10, seven orders of magnitude more efficient than density functional theory. And it's about 10 orders of magnitude is more efficient compared to the couple cluster theory, depending on your system size. And again, anyone uh, CC uh, is, has been released uh, for the public. So this is, an example of the reactive uh, force dynamics when we have the hard carbon mix and out of the hard carbon, a uh, hard carbon uh, at 2,500 K, we are running five nanosecond molecular dynamics. And then at the end, at the end of the day, we have formation of the fullerenes, we have formation of graphene at, and in general soot. And this movie was made by Justin Smith, now a staff member at Los Alamos. And he did this movie on his laptop over the night. And just I remind you for chemists probably know that, that examples uh, of the KG Marakuma uh, quantum mechanical modeling of the fully information took about six months of interrogating uh, the entire cluster back in 2005. And now we can do those simulations on um, essentially your laptop uh, overnight. So again, one can analyze in the various dimensions what would be the data diversity 
and one could just look at the chemical diversity where we don't move the molecules. And then we could analyze when we stretch the molecules and we could uh, recognize the regions corresponding to the chemical bonds, such as SP, SP2, hybridization for carbon, and various types of bonds uh, for hydrogen and so forth. And we have been releasing every piece of uh, these things. And then if you need any of those data or you need an access to those neural nets, please drop me an email. So now let's move to the metals. So what if you would have at your disposal the second uh, uh, computer uh, in the world, which would be located in Lawrence Livermore called Sierra. So it's an insane computer power where you have most of the nodes to be GPU nodes and you have uh, this machine to your unlimited use. And that has happened back in 2019 um, in December. So uh, we have been modeling metals under extreme conditions. And of course, if you have this big machine, then you need hands-free fully automatic active learning sampler of all possible configurations. So we decided to make this algorithm full hands-free type. And we were considering just melt, random phases of the combination of the uh, atoms. You have somewhere crystal phase, liquid phase, extreme condition, random disorder. And the only thing that have been uh, put in control is to get rid of unphysical configuration and then we can use, use the active learning sampler. At the end, sort of like we come up with uh, aluminum potentials. And for aluminum, we are able to achieve with the hands-free sampler, the accuracy of the best aluminum potentials that is known to date. And that re reproduce uh, the known stable configuration of the aluminum. But moreover, all those, uh, our potentials are able to reproduce the non-equilibrium conditions such as shocks. You'll see this in a moment. So that we could learn a lot what is going on there. Of course, we could do some numerical experiment. One could melt and then freeze the aluminum and compare to the parent density functional theory simulations. And you could see one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, you could do the phase transition, like from FCC to BCC, et cetera, et cetera. You could play all those games. And finally, you could have a shock. And this simulation has been done with uh, more than 1 million of aluminum atoms. And those simulations are completely impossible using density functional theory from which we have been uh, uh, learning. So and you could see, so let me see, what can I do here? Oops, there are nice movies and I don't just want. Yep, so you could see the shocks and you could see the dislocation formation and one can analyze uh, both of those things and to see what is going on there. So this is just snapshots uh, from the shock simulations and you could see how the structure of the materials breaks through dislocation and how the dynamics of shocks is propagating through the material. Again, sort of like for data science people, it is very important to analyze the diversity of the data set that you are learning. So you could just disentangle the whole thing, for example, like where you have the random disorder, where you have various phases, where you have the liquid phase, and so forth and so forth. Okay, so now um, let's move to a little bit more complicated case, which is tin. And tin is a metal that destroys itself in the winter because it has two stable phases, alpha phase and beta phase. Um, so once you lower the temperature, below zero or well below zero, then you could see this uh, phase transition between alpha and beta phase. And the rumors are 
um, it was sort of like very hurting Napoleon once uh, his army invaded uh, Russia back in 1812. Okay, so this is from... Uh, uh, now we can uh, try to uh, learn the potential for teen, but it's not so easy. So here we have alpha and beta phases. And while we can do very well, um, still the active learning does not perform in the um, hand-free regime. And I'll explain you in a moment, and this is a glaring problem currently with the training of all the uh, machine learning uh, uh, potentials. Still, one can go and reproduce very well some things for the teens, such as radial distribution function, structure factors, and so forth. Now, let me give you a glimpse where the machine learning uh, goes in the future. So my main statement here is that usually when we are having interatomic potential. When we are running in molecular dynamics, then those potentials depend only on the coordinate and velocity of the particles. Remember the first slides I've shown you. You have the forces, you have the masses, you have the velocities, and I can propagate the Newtonian equations. But my statement here, it's not enough. So that simulation history and memory effects are very important and they're entering through the extraneous variables. So I'll give you one simple example. You have a chemical reactions. You break the water into the either charged species or to the radicals. Seemingly the coordinates and velocities could be the same, but the chemical properties of the resulting species would be very different. So that one need to incorporate the reminiscence of the quantum mechanics such as polarization, charge density, maybe wave function, something like that, into the training as extraneous variables. And then that, another example would be the uh, shocks. This is aluminum shocks. And here you have the transition from the solid to the liquid, or phase transition. And to describe the phase transition, perhaps the temperature would be an important microscopic variables so that one can uh, learn uh, uh, also by including the temperature into the training set. So, okay, so maybe another 10 minutes, I will go into my uh, final topic about learning something else. So far, we have been operating with uh, neural nets as a black box. Just remember sort of like we are given the coordinates and then there is a black box and outside of this black box, you have the energies of the system and you have the forces so that you're able to do the molecular dynamics. But now some people are saying, hey, I would like to retain more of the physical model. I still like the quantum mechanics and I would like to learn the minimalistic quantum mechanical model that is able to describe the, uh, my system. We call it reduced Hamiltonians. So that this is a standard way. We are replacing the density functional theory simulations with an ensemble of the neural nets and we are getting the parameters one by one. So far I have been talking about the energies, but one can get uh, also the density, the charges, one can get uh, vibrational frequencies, so that it's not a problem, so it's just an extension of the previous uh, models that I have been showing you, and one could go across the set of papers to see how it can be done. So the training to the new uh, machine learning Hamiltonian will allow to first to a better understanding on the nature of physical phenomena, where you have a reduced quantum mechanical model, and then one can get many of those properties directly, and one can get something like running quantum molecular dynamic simulations. So one of the important difference that between the previous simulations and simulations that I'll show now is that we, instead of the diagonal elements, we are now need to learn the matrix. So let's talk about the charge density or the density matrix. 
What we have on the diagonal would be the charges on individual atoms. Remember that when we learn the energies, we have exactly the same model when on the diagonal we had the energies of the individual effect effective atoms. And again, we could learn those charges. This mission can be accomplished. Now for the off diagonals, you have the bond orders. And one could learn the bond order. However, the bond order depends on the pairs of the atoms. In fact, this is something like interaction between two distinct atoms, whether they are bonded or not. Same thing for the Hamiltonians. You have side energy. This is just a tight binding type of Hamiltonian without any complication. On the diagonal, you have the side energies. And for the off diagonal elements, you have the hopping or interaction elements. So that again, one need to introduce this uh, pairwise interaction into uh, your training sets. And in fact, it has been done. Uh, I'll show you in a moment. It has been done on the level of Hippon and uh, neural nets. This is one example of uh, one of the oldest example of the effective Hamiltonians. In chemistry, it's um, known as the Huckel theory, extended Huckel theory. In solid state physics, it's known as a tight binding model. So again, sort of like it has diagonal and off diagonal elements. And the whole idea was to get rid of this model and to optimize Hamiltonian parameters so that you could match the values obtained for DFT for eigenvalues and for energies. And this is how our machine learning scheme works for the learning Huckel Hamiltonians. This is again HIP and N, where we are learning the diagonal elements. And here we have those green bars, which is like a many body expansion. But now in addition to this, there is an extension which are, we, are, we are learning the pair interaction elements. And again, there are those uh, interaction uh, bars. So now, how in this case, how should we uh, formulate the machine learning task and the loss function? So the first thing one could just have, what would be the energy error? One could just uh, take the difference between the reference density functional theory orbital energies and our trained data, uh, data sets. But frequently, uh, but we soon realize that it's not the case. We are getting very bad results because we are not following the wave function. The wave function and the localized wave function is a very important variable to follow because those levels, those energetic levels tend to cross once you change the molecular geometry so that we introduce into the error, the, into the cost function, an error in both energy and orbitals and, and uh, wave function. So of course, you put the uh, orbital energy error in requested with much higher accuracy compared to the wave function error. So again, sort of like you train it, you get uh, the orbitals. And in fact, sort of like we can reproduce the density functional theory orbitals um, with the accuracy of about 100 milli electron volts. And the errors are much larger as expected for the wave function. You could validate somewhere. So one thing is that uh, I didn't talk enough about that, but once you have the machine learned uh, neural nets, it's extremely important to test the questions of extensibility and transferability. The extensibility means, so remember that we have been training to fairly small molecules, but what would happen if you extend your molecules and start to uh, train to the very large molecular uh, sizes? Not train, but to apply to very large molecular sizes. And Transferability means when you are transferring from one family of the molecules to another family of the molecules. So that, for example, one, uh, once we can go from our small molecular data sets to somewhere uh, to tripeptides and drug bank, we could immediately see where, what we are missing. The extensibility is not working well 
for aromatic compounds. Why? Because we have the delocalized pi electronic uh, wave functions. And we cannot uh, reproduce those quantities by training to uh, small molecules. And also sort of like if you are training to only the valence orbitals, um, to the field orbitals, we cannot uh, reproduce the valence states and so forth and so on. So in general, sort of like it's uh, like there is a saying, trash is in, trash is out. So another question is, how can you test the, uh, that your physical model is right? So one could just look at the original uh, model of the time bind uh, Hackel and one could just see that, for example, the site energy for the hydrogen is about minus 13.6. And this is exactly what we are getting when we are training, however, the parameters for the machine learn are flexible with respect to the molecular geometry. So if you think about this derived machine learn Hackel uh, or tight binding model, then the parameters are not fixed, but the parameters are flexible and this flexibility sort of is given by the width of those distributions. So what can we learn from this? I will not go into too much of the details, but uh, let me show the one example of the chemical reaction. When you go from the uh, uh, butadiene and you rotate around the chemical bonds, and during this rotation, we have a cross of the molecular orbitals. And this is an example of the unavoided crossing. And you could see that Machine learn model, even though it was not specifically trained to the botadiene, machine learn model does understand and does predict this unavoided crossing. In the case of the other botadiene, we have a case of um, unavoided crossing. You see this gap. And of course, sort of like DFT is reproducing this unavoided crossing and machine learning is following, even though it was not trained to this case. So what is the path forward? And uh, we really love the smaller Hamiltonian models. Now we are talking about retraining all the semi-empirical packages and there are many semi-empirical Hamiltonians. And now we have been ported them into the PyTorch framework. And in fact, we uh, have been uh, having this uh, code, uh, PySQM, which is released uh, for, again, for the common use. It has a basic molecular uh, Hamiltonians, semi-empirical molecular Hamiltonians. And it, can, it is possible that it runs very fast molecular dynamics on GPUs. And it blows away all of the common semi-empirical codes because it has all the bells and whistles for the ground state molecular dynamics. So the future, uh, so, uh, our future plans is that to retrain the common semi-empirical models so that we could reproduce, for example, the DFT energies on the quantum mechanical levels, and it's already done. And Jean-Luc will like it. So we'll try to reproduce uh, also the excited state energies and the excited state force field so that we could uh, run the quantum mechanical dynamics for the excited state in the reduced Hamiltonian setting. So the uh, future is really exciting. So uh, I'm, I guess I'm running out of uh, time and let me conclude that overall, um, we are learning that artificial intelligence indeed allows us to cut the corners. We are able to speed up a lot conventional simulations and we are bypassing the quantum uh, costly quantum mechanical simulations. So the scaling bar barriers are breaking. So the machine learning is not an automatic of shell procedure. It requires both time and understanding of both worlds, physics and data science. And it's very difficult to find people who can understand both. Those people are golden and frequently students and postdocs are having, uh, are mig migrating directly to Google, to Tesla, etc. What I learned from Misha, that physics in Ford machine learning, now Misha Chertkov migrated from Los Alamos to University of Arizona. It's a loss for us that physics in, war, in machine learning is a key in all this development. 
And there is much to be done. So we are trying to share everything that we are producing. And instead of sort of like demonstrating uh, application to a specific problem, now we need to look at the experimentally motivated problems and solve the experimentally motivated uh, uh, setups. And again, so the whole field is moving toward making and distributing user-friendly machine learning packages so that, for example, like experimentalists can take it from the shelf and do the molecular dynamic simulations or whatever by using their favorite system. So this is my take home message. So that the reactive uh, chemistry is addressable using machine learning. And at some point uh, you will see that the hydrogen will migrate uh, between uh, two atoms. So we have bond breaking and uh, bond, ma uh, bond making. There are a lot of people have, uh, that have been participating in this work. There is a lot of uh, Los Alamos par uh, uh, participants like Kipton Barras, uh, Ben Neptgen, Justin Smith, Anders Nicholson. Uh, those are people who have developed uh, neural nets, built the databases, help us with the uh, ab initio molecular dynamics. Um, Galen Graven, Walter Malone, um, Nick Labbers, uh, Yin Wai. So again, those uh, data science people, and we have a lot of help from the summer students. So in experiment, we are interacting a lot uh, across uh, various uh, uh, Los Alamos divisions, such as, for example, if you'd like to model self-assembly, if you'd like to model uh, shocks in metals, how can we compare to experiment and ultimately incorporate the experimental data. And this is a whole new universe that they have been touching yet. For example, you have LCLS, one LCLS2, and from those uh, X-ray lasers, you could have a very detailed information on the structure uh, modifications under extreme conditions. And this would be the true ground truth, which goes beyond DFT, which goes beyond couple clusters that ultimately can be used for training, not just for validation of our trained neural nets. And of course, we have a lot of uh, external collaborations like uh, Ole Sisaev, Adrian Reutberg, uh, and many more groups uh, across the globe. You know, many um, sources of funding. And before, so I talked a little bit about uh, Krishna, and let me just finish that most of this work has been done under the umbrella of Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies, or SINT, which is a DOE user facility. And uh, you're very welcome to come to collaborate with us. We are writing the user proposal and sort of like, uh, for example, our collaboration with Chad Riska is goes under the umbrella of the SYNT proposal. And there are many more examples uh, of utility of this DOE user facilities. So that there is a conversation established between academia, for example, or industry and the national labs. And I also should say that the national lab is a very good place for students and postdocs. This year, Los Alamos had nearly 1,000 students working remotely. Last year, 1,000 students came on site. That's plus 10% of population of Los Alamos. So this year, the students have been working virtually. We provide them access to the computers and sort of like uh, communicate uh, remotely. And also at any moment, we have uh, uh, about 400 postdocs uh, uh, working and postdoctoral experience is a very nice one. Thank you so much for your kind attention and let's go to the questions and answers. We have at least 10 minutes. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Sergey. This was a great talk. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Um, people feel free to ask questions. It could range all the way from, you know, deep scientific questions to how do I get an internship at Los Alamos? So the floor is, uh, students feel free to ask questions. Uh, try to, you know, if you want me to ask the questions, you are shy, I can ask uh, on your behalf too. Yeah, you, they could type in chat. Yes. You could uh, communicate through the chat. Yep. Anyone, so let me, I, I see a lot of people, in fact, there's a lot of people, 70 people I think logged in, so that's great. And, and 60 people are still on, 
on here. So this is once again, uh, incredible. So, Rafi? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I remember you mentioning earlier that it becomes increasingly difficult to uh, get like excited states, for example, excited state dynamics, et cetera, as compared to the ground state. Is there a trade-off for like with system size maybe, where if you want to get the excited state but have a much smaller system, then you would calculate um, dynamics for, for the, the ground state? Does it get easier or is it just prohibitively difficult in general? So the problem with excited state in general is that the wave functions of the excited states are quickly getting localized to uh, different parts of the system. The classic uh, problem that I impose to my collaborators is that let me have a bucket of uh, material. Could be polymers, could be whatever. So and now I drop a single electron. Can you tell me where this electron will end up? So that this electron can be uh, end up in very localized state or in very delocalized state. So that's the whole thing. When you have the large molecule, so and then let's have you have a distortion, then your electron can be here or electron can be there. Those would be two nearly degenerate excited states. But what if you do run in the dynamics and the molecule become planar and the electrons start to delocalize between those uh, spots? This quantum mechanical nature of those uh, transitions and this dynamics needs to be incorporated. This is what I was trying to uh, elaborate to you that those complicated phenomena needs to go beyond the coordinates and velocities and this mechanistic description. This learning needs to be done with additional variables, such as, for example, the density, delocalization, temperature, charges, polarization, and so forth. And compared to the classical force fields, we have a lot more freedom with machine learning. Uh, Sergey, I think your namesake has a question. Sergey, uh, Yushika, feel free to ask your questions. It's your, your chance now. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Yeah, a question I posted in the chat. I, can you please expand on, um, on using machine learning for uh, processing the real synchrotron data for, for machine learning rather than for validation? It's not okay, so uh, let me see. Oh, okay, now, now I, I have the chart in front of me. Um, so the question is, so how can you use the synchrotron data for machine learning rather than uh, uh, for validation? So let me sort of like flash uh, several ideas. Let's look at the molecules. With uh, synchrotron data, such as LCLS, LCLS2, it is possible, for example, to obtain a real-time dynamics of the chemical reactions or real-time dynamics in the biological systems. So then, in fact, I have the molecular dynamics trajectory with uh, 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 coordinates of all the atoms. And this could be sort of like my ground truth where I can use uh, to train those data after I train, for example, to the density functional uh, data, I can delta learn or transfer learn to the experimental data, which would be much scarcer, but it would be exactly along the lines that I've shown you. Here we have DFT and here we have couple clusters. The whole principle can be applied there. Another thing that one can get from the um, uh, synchrotron data would be the evolution of the density. So that one can uh, get and transfer learn the evolution of the density compared to the parent density functional theory. Finally, sort of like one could uh, explore in the synchrotron highly non-equilibrium conditions and uh, phase transitions and one could incorporate those uh, data as well into the, uh, into the uh, training sets. Again, what I'm saying, 
this is just how I pose the problem. But the real solution remains to be seen. I hope like uh, even in three years from now, I will ask uh, you, uh, I will come and uh, can provide some answers. But in principle, this is a very important problem and we need to work on the uh, implementation. Thanks, Sergey. I think next is uh, Marius. Marius had a question followed by Slava. So Marius. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Marius. Okay, Sergey, thank you. Thank you for the excellent presentation. And also thank you for, for bringing back uh, uh, dear memories of Los Alamos National Lab where I used to work. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you mentioned in your, uh, you made a comment in your presentation, but uh, you also quoted Misha Shashkov. Chertkov. That the reason- Not, not I, Shashkov, there but is, there is another uh, person, Misha Chertkov, but there is also Chert Misha Shashkov. Yeah, Chertkov, uh, sorry. Shashkov is there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember both of them. Uh, yeah. The idea is that you, you stated that it would be, it is desirable to connect somehow the results of machine learning to fundamental physics. No, I would like to challenge that. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I'm at Argo National Lab now. We are, we are using machine learning, for example, to evaluate, to optimize force fields. And we do that in a fractions of an hour compared to weeks or months that we used to work on before. So the question to you, and I think this is of interest to, to, to both uh, uh, accomplished and experienced scientists and the students too, is do we really need theory? Is theory perhaps something that was rooted in the desire of the human brain to understand, to capture in a simple relationship something fundamental about nature or can we be satisfied with this return to empiricism which i believe machine learning is so if we get the results quickly and the predictions are correct can we live without a physics backed explanation a fundamental theory or not i mean this is a million dollar question maybe a billion dollar question <laughs> so and i guess um, it's not about the physical sciences. I'll give you another um, example. For example, if you are machine learning and teaching Tesla to navigate, you can hardwire the, um, the book of traffic rules into navigation, or you could learn from the millions of drivers. And in fact, the later was more beneficial when they had, uh, have been... Uh, making the Tesla software. However, once you learn from millions of drivers, the car will never stop on the stop sign. So this is exactly the thing. Where is this subtle barrier when you hard impose your physical laws and where you are trying to bypass the physical laws and you would like to uh, use your product. And to me, sort of like as working in academic science, I would like always to understand it. But perhaps for someone uh, working in the industry, they would like to use more of the product without the understanding. So I guess there is no yes or no questions. There is a whole palette. But from the point of view of the data science, it all boils to the uncertainty quantification. What happened if I will cross the boundary? Will my result would be qualitatively correct or I completely uh, predict something bogus? So, and if one sort of like would like to uh, answer to those questions, I guess it would be problem specific. I'll give you one example. If you are talking about interatomic potentials, one could use the black box and energies and forces. But if you're talking to the buyer people, the buyer people will tell you, hey, I'm not satisfied with that. I would like to see what is going on with my torsional potentials. I would rather machine learn the torsional potentials and incorporate into my existing physical models. Both ways are the correct ways. 
and it depends on the kind of problem and kind of people that are trying to solve this problem. So another thing sort of like, I'm not satisfied with this black box and therefore I would like to see what my quantum mechanics uh, would, uh, can offer. And therefore, instead of the force field, I can learn the minimalistic Hamiltonian model. Is it wrong or right? I think both. So it depends on the problem. And again, sort of like we could sample this room and every person would have its own opinion. But one thing should one keep in mind for my favorite saying is that if DFT is a black box, then machine learning is even blacker. Uh, thank you, Sergey. That, that was an excellent answer. I would like to continue the discussion. Thank yeah, thanks. I can okay. answer yeah, fully. <laughs> uh, so we have at least three more uh, people with questions. Uh, Slava, Haoyan, and Yi. So you, can, you guys can ask the questions in the same order. Slava? Oh, OK. Uh, hello? Uh, yes. Do you hear me? Yes, uh, Hi, Sergey. Uh, very nice talk. I have Thank a question. Uh, I would assume that uh, the force field you have presented is limited for a specific number of chemical elements right now, right? Yes. Um, so so okay. if, you, if you want to add a new chemical element in this uh, basis set, whatever you call it, do you have to retrain everything or the force field that you got already is transferable for bigger class of uh, elements? Okay, um, so there are two parts. So I presented the force field only for the limited numbers. But if you look at the literature, if you look what Justin Smith has been publishing, there have been another five papers in various flavors that people have been adding the, to the force field, uh, for example, like fluorine, chlorine, uh, there are this any force field uh, which includes at least 20 elements, all the first rows. Currently, we are fooling around the force field that includes uh, the transition methods. So the general answer is you don't need to retrain the whole thing. But what you need to do to the uh, start with your existing force field and use the active learning to add more from the unknown phase space, which is represented by this, uh, by this unknown elements. And this would be much, much more efficient strategy compare if you would start, uh, start from the scratch. Please note that overall the neural net structure will change, but the expanse, once you sort of extend to the new elements would be minimal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so is, is alpha included in these uh, elements? That... So I guess sort of like uh, you could simply download the, any uh, data, any force field which includes those uh, first two rows of uh, uh, periodic table. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So and let's talk if you need more. Yeah. We'll, remember we'll... and remember sort of like uh, the adding the new element is not a bigger deal compare, so provided that you have uh, enough uh, chemical and conformational space that you can train to. In the beginning, what uh, somebody from chemistry has asked me the question, what are you going to do with those spin species, charged species, radical species, or generally excited state? This is a much more complicated problem. Okay, thank you, thank you. Are we on? You're Hi. You're next. Uh, thank you for the very uh, interesting and nice talk. Uh, I'm a, my name is Hao Yuan Li. I'm a research scientist in the Bridas Research Group. Um, can you comment on the uh, time scales of the MD simulations that use these uh, machine learning force fields? I, mean, I would like to know if I can uh, use it to study uh, chemical reactions uh, that happen in uh, like mi microseconds or milliseconds. Thank you. So microseconds or milliseconds so we went to up to uh microsecond time scales and uh -huh. for microsecond time scales i guess one can easily run ten thousand of atoms to hundred thousand of atoms it depends on your system okay i see so uh what what is the time step you use in those md simulations 
uh, the usual time steps that you're using with a classical force field. It depends so, on the system. So can I understand this uh, machine learning force fields as uh, uh, similar to uh, the uh, the other force field, but it's just it's very efficient in evaluating the uh, energies and forces. Yeah. So for example, um, are you familiar with the lumps code? Uh, no, I mean, I, I use Gromax mainly. Okay, the Gromax. So, for example, in Gromax, you could change uh, one force field uh, to another, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, M, like Ember to Charm, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right? So, uh, right. currently, we have implemented the, our force fields into the LAMPS. And LAMPS is a product of uh, Sandia National Labs. And there, you just Put another force field, and then you are you are good to start with a new set of simulations. Okay, got it. So it it just another interatomic uh, uh, potentials. Okay, so the penalty, I... the penalty would be to conventional force field. The penalty would be about factor of five. Mm -hmm. So I assume you will need uh, GPU cards to run those AMD simulations. Um. So for the lumps, yes and no, it can run on the hybrid architecture. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think the next um, question is from E. Hi, uh, yes, thank you. Sorry um, so if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. That's that's perfect. Okay. Um, so my, my question is more conceptual. Uh, so my understanding uh, is that there are two ways to claim victory in this field. One is you um, improve the generalization performance and the other is to show that the model uh, somehow mimics the, the real physics system. So in, the, in either way, um, you, you, you will need to create some sort of risk uh, metric and then you try to minimize that. Uh, my question is that, um, is there a need uh, to, to de develop series um, and, and, and show um, a, like a lower bound for for these metrics, and if so, if so, it, whether there's a need to develop verifiable models um, for which you can be sure that the risk will be under a threshold. If not, if if such models are not existent existence, then um, how do people um, see these error metrics or risk metrics, right? So when you say, okay, I have an MSE of 0.01, you say, no, that's not good. But if it's 0.0001, you say that's good. Um, that's very subjective, right? Is there a consensus on how you tell whether the model is good enough or not? Yeah, this is a very excellent question. So in general, there is no such well-defined risk matrix. However, if you are, we are talking to chemists and to material scientists, they have very uh, a set of numbers which are considered to be good. For example, if you are talking to the world of chemistry, then one kcal per mole would be the number that you would like to match from your simulations. And we are understanding very well where DFT is standing uh, with respect to those numbers, for example. So that would be sort of like a golden standard. If you are talking about excited states, like 100 mil electron volts would be the golden standard for excited state uh, simulations. So for every physical quantity that this hand waving risk matrix exists. So now okay. if I will turn this question and I ask, is a, there is any um, uncertainty quantification for the machine learned neural nets that we guarantee to address this risk matrix? Then I would say it's open field for the discussion. There are a lot of efforts in this area uh, across the globe, how we can quantify the uncertainty in using various methodologies. Mm -hmm. Mm, right, right. I have a, a much smaller question. Do you use graph networks? No. Um, well, um, but, but when you have molecular systems, um, 
when you when you try to deal with, for example, permutation invariance and also um, um, generalization across um, an arbitrary number of uh, um, atoms, for example. Um, yeah. So uh, how do you remember. Deal with yeah, yeah, yeah. So all those things I achieved very is very simple conversion to the smile strings. It's kind of a graphical network, but it's a very standard and simple one. And for those things, uh, all those uh, symmetry operations are automatically satisfied. It's not like we are using X, Y, Z's. The key is uh, like smile strings and then smile strings is a standard representation of the structures uh, for uh, data science applications. Okay, okay, I'll read your papers. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that was Max actually. Max is actually my colleague uh, here at Mechanical Engineering, as an assistant professor here. Yeah. Thank you, Max. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. And I think the next person is. Um, I, I I just lost the. I think Stanislaw had a question, but he says that there's a loud construction noise in the background, so I'm going to ask the question on his behalf. The question is, what are the systems that can reveal the limitations of your ANI? So, so the limitation of the training sets. So let's talk about chemical reactions. So there are many, many limitations, but let's talk about simple one, the chemical reaction. Okay, so the chemical reaction when the system goes over the barrier. And then to represent well the chemical reaction, you need to represent this phase space of the high energy near the barrier. So you need to include this phase space into the, uh, your training set. Now, if you are using the active learning, how your uh, active learning is working, you sample the molecular trajectory, which is going around. And then you see if this molecular trajectory touches the region of the phase space, which you need to include to your training. But the bigger question is how can I get this molecular trajectory to get into the reactive space to this barrier uh, region? And this is one of the limitations. And there are a lot of room for improvement. For example, currently we are paying a lot of attention how to apply the bias so that the bias will drive me and to make me sample this relevant phase space to the uh, reaction dynamics that I want to would like to model. And we have been naming uh, a lot of other limitations such as new chemical elements, um, reactive species, I mean the uh, spin states, excited states. And also, uh, I didn't talk a, a lot about that, but also there was a big question about long range interactions. Long range interactions such as dispersive interactions, which change the dynamic of the system when the uh, molecules are uh, far apart. And remember that uh, the locality has been built in into the neural nets because I encasted uh, every atom into the effective sphere diameter. So this, the whole thing uh, would be uh, some kind of limitation. The bigger question is, and this is a uh, subject specific uh, problem, is that whether you could live with existing accuracy or you need to build something else from the side to address this limitation. If you are talking about the dispersive interaction, where I need to uh, retrain my neural nets to include the long range dispersive interactions, or I can add something like a post processing correction like it's done in the density functional theory, which accounts to those dispersive interactions. It's all uh, problem specific. Okay. I think, um... That's a lot of questions and still there are lots of participants here, but any, any guys, do you have any parting shots, any, any students uh, about possibility of, uh, you know, applying for internships or, or other collaborative methods with LANL? Anyone? Okay. I have a question uh, quickly around that same thing, which 
which just, you just mentioned, Krishna. <laughs> uh, what's, what's the, so I have like, I teach a materials kinetics course and also I teach structures and defects course, which goes back to, you know, characterization methods and atomic level description of materials. So many of my students are uh, very eager to apply to these national labs uh, at the undergraduate level. So can you just sort of give a broader view of what's a typical approach a student should adopt to, to obtain an internship, for example, at, at, at these uh, groups, which really work at the cutting edge of science? So um, again, in general, uh, if before summer, you will visit Los Alamos webpage, then there will be openings, uh, general application process where you upload your CV, recommendation letters, etc. so that there is a general lab-wide application process. Mm -hmm. But it's much more profitable if the students can contact directly mm -hmm. the relevant people. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, if your student will contact me and saying, hey, I'm on my PhD, I'm working on such and such problem, and I would like to add the modeling or theory component along these lines. Yeah. So that um, if it's, uh, for example, of interest of my immediate group, we could consider uh, this application. Or if I know that somebody else is working on this type of uh, science, then I could re direct the student to a specific person. All right. yeah. okay. Again, concrete applications uh, are much better compared to the generic one. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, and um, Sergey, and before we sign off, I wanted you to I wanted you to meet Christina. To Christina is a fellow organizer of the seminar series. She's a assistant professor at ASU in the School of Molecular Sciences. And uh, hi, nice meeting you. Hi, hi, Christina. Great talk. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. Thanks so much for talking. Thanks. Okay, Sergey. I think uh, it's time. I think it's we've gone past the the time uh, allocated. So thanks a lot. There was a lot of interest. I'm sure some of the students may contact you, uh, assuming that they're interested in, in working with you. Uh, but other than that, there's one thing that I keep, and it's completely my fault. We've had these polos for all our speakers and I need to ship it. It's just that I'm so lazy. I'm not stepping out of the house that I'm <laughs> the the original intention was to ship it to the speaker so that they wear it during the talk uh but you know I, I need to go to campus and it's been like three months since i went in so i need to go in one day and, and uh, make sure that i ship it to everyone we may contact you to get your shipping address so so uh, you know regarding the uh this polo, I got uh, literally like a uh, few days ago, I got the t-shirt and I wanted to uh, wear it. It's from AAAS. Uh, American oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Advancement so, of science. Yeah. So you can trust me. I'm peer reviewed. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You should have worn it. That would have been <laughs> <Yeah>. really nice. <laughs> cool, Sergey. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And, Thank uh, you, see you so much. Thank you uh, so much for hosting me. And, and, and what it. we'll do is we will upload it on the cha YouTube channel and uh, we'll send the link to you to feel free to share it or even put it on your website, whatever. Okay, How great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Sergey. Thanks. Bye, Ankit. Bye, Christina. See you all. Thanks.